Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the next edition of A Book Observed. Uh, tonight, we are going to uh, welcome our good friend, Dr. Don Williams, back. We had him just a few weeks ago uh, exploring the Christian worldview behind uh, Tolkien. And tonight, we're going to dive into Deeper Magic, taken from his book by that title, and explore the theology in Lewis's work. And we're going to get deeper into his thinking and his worldview, and, and Don will unpack all that. Uh, before we do, I just want to thank you for joining us. If you're a, a regular, uh, we'd love to get emails from you. If you just email us um, at staff at cslewisinstitute.org and in the, in the subject line, put attention to book observed. We'd love to hear your comments and your ideas for, um, for future iterations of this. Uh, this will probably be the last one for the year before the holidays, but we'd love to just keep this going. There's so much uh, rich uh, work in Lewis's corpus that we could explore. Uh, I'd also like just to take a moment, since we're coming up to the end of the year, um, we try to provide these events both online and in person in all of our cities for free, but we know that these events aren't free, so we really appreciate your support. So if you uh, love this work and you want to see more of it, please consider making a donation uh, at our website. If you just go to cslewisinstitute.org slash give and pick the city that you live in or that you're closest to to support them so we can just keep bringing you great content like this. Okay, so without further ado, you're not here to hear me. You're here to hear our good friend, Dr. Don Williams. Uh, I, I think weather's a lot warmer where you are. I'm in Chicago, and you're uh, just north of Atlanta. So uh, welcome again. It really is. It's good to have you back tonight, Don. Um, it's good to be back, yeah. Real quick, what do you have in store for us tonight? What, what do you, Where are you going to be going tonight? What I would like to do is convince you that C.S. Lewis matters, as a not just as a Christian writer, not just as a Christian apologist, although he matters greatly in those roles, yeah. but that Lewis matters as a theologian. Uh, some people uh, immediately stumble over that idea because, of course, Lewis was not a professional minister. He's not a professional theologian. But Lewis probably got more Christian ideas into more heads than anybody else in the 20th century, with the exception of maybe somebody like Billy Graham, Hmm. And so what he thought about Christian doctrine matters. I run into people on the internet, I'm sure you do too, who think Lewis was a saint who could do no wrong, yeah. and a, a, a smaller but louder bunch who think Lewis was a heretic and Christians shouldn't be reading him at all. So a guy who was as influential and as instrumental in as many conversions, like Charles Colson, for example, as Lewis was, certainly needs a judicious appraisal of his theology. And so in, in my book, Deeper Magic, I survey the whole, uh, the whole set of topics that constitutes systematic theology. The table of contents looks like the table of contents of a systematic theology text. But then I go through Lewis's writings, all of Lewis's writings, to show in each of these areas uh, what is the presentation Lewis makes of Christian truth in that area. And then I try to ask, what are his strengths and weaknesses as a guide to biblical truth? And it has a lot of strengths. I think it has a few weaknesses. But uh, all of us, I think, really will benefit from thinking through some of these issues so I'm not going to deal with very many specific aspects of Lewis's theology tonight. I want to just talk about the, the whole, what it means to think of Lewis as a theologian. What kind of a theologian was he? Obviously an amateur one, but that doesn't mean he wasn't one. Yeah. And uh, what aspects of his influence in these areas can help us uh, to gain a greater understanding of Christian truth and a greater rootedness in Christian truth, and what areas might we need to uh, be a little bit more critical of and, and appreciate. The great thing about Lewis is, even when I think he's wrong, it's helpful to read him because he's wrong in instructive ways. Yeah, And uh, so we're going to be opening up some of those ideas tonight. Okay. Well, I don't want to steal your thunder. So without further ado, I'll... Uh... I'll check out for a bit, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us tonight, Don. Thanks. Okay. Title of this lecture is Cartographer of the Divine, C.S. Lewis as Doctor Ecclesia. That means teacher of the church. Um, Lewis 
is important for so many reasons. And one of those reasons is the fact that, as he said himself, he was a dinosaur. Use your specimens while you can, Lewis said. There aren't going to be many more dinosaurs. Well, Lewis is a, is a guy who is extremely intelligent and who knows how to write and can write about very difficult, abstruse topics in ways that normal human beings can understand. Uh, this gets him sort of patronized as a theologian by scholars, and yet it's really capturing what the job of the theologian ought to be, which is to teach Christian truth to the people of Christ, to the church. Uh, when theology, I think, was more healthy than it is now, its audience was believers. Its audience was the church. Today, the audience of theology has become academics. Uh, theologians talk to each other about these things. Well, Lewis, as the kind of dinosaur he was, can get us past that and can be helpful for just normal Christians thinking about some of these ideas. When George Sayers' first meeting with his new Oxford tutor, C.S. Lewis, ended, Another Oxford faculty member named J.R.R. Tolkien was waiting to see Lewis next. How did the new freshman get on with Lewis, Tolkien wanted to know. Rather well, Sayer figured, adding that he thought Lewis was going to make quite an interesting mentor. Interesting, Tolkien replied. Yes, he's certainly that. You'll never get to the bottom of him. Well, this lecture is not going to get to the bottom of Lewis either. It mainly deals with Lewis's theology, only one of many aspects of his rich and fertile thought. It won't even get to the bottom of that. It will, though, try to indicate why Lewis matters, not just as a Christian fantasy writer and apologist, but as a theologian, a teacher of the church. Lewis's theology is somewhat surprisingly a relatively neglected aspect of his influence. There's only one book on the market that tries to survey Lewis's theology as a whole that I know of, besides mine, and that is Will Vouse's Mere Theology, and it consists almost entirely of summary. Now, it's accurate summary. I'll give Will credit for that, but it's almost entirely summary with relatively little analysis or critique. I, I asked Will about that, and he said, well, I wanted to put in the analysis and the critique, but the publisher wouldn't let me because they thought the book wouldn't sell. Uh, fortunately, I found a publisher that did let me do those things. Other book link studies focus on Lewis's approach to only one doctrine, like uh, Christensen uh, in Bibliology, Payne, Pneumatology, Brazier, Christology, or one area, like Apologetics, Pertle, Burson and Walls, Louis Marcus, or one idea, Victor Reppert on the argument from reason. Uh, we don't have another book that I know of that looks at Lewis's presentation of Christian doctrine as a unified whole and asks, what are its strengths and weaknesses as a guide to biblical faith? That is the whole that I hope my book, Mere, uh, not Mere uh, Theology, that's uh, Will's book. My book, uh, Deeper Magic, will try to fill. It's a strange hole to find in Lewis's studies. For while he was not a professional theologian, Lewis might well have gotten more Christian doctrinal content into more heads than anyone else who was a professional theologian in his day or since. He saw himself as a translator, putting abstruse theological ideas back into the language of the people because the professional theologians had forgotten that these truths were for the people of God. He said, with excessive self-deprecation, if the real theologians had tackled this laborious work of translation about a hundred years ago, when they began to lose touch with the people for whom Christ died, there would have been no place for me. Well, the place was there, and we can be glad for the way that Lewis filled it. Lewis may well then be the most important amateur theologian ever. Now, Many people, including famously Charles Colson, testified to having been brought to faith in Christ by Lewis's writings, and many more to having been preserved in the faith by discovering him in a period of doubt or questioning. The broadcast talks, which became mere Christianity, made Lewis the second most recognizable voice on the BBC in the 1940s after Winston Churchill, and his influence has only grown since. 
60 years after his death, almost all his books are still in print. Those which briefly go out tend to cycle back in, and his popularity, especially with American evangelicals, shows no signs of fading. As an evangelist, indirectly, an apologist, an expounder, and incarnator in fiction of the faith, Lewis was one of the most imaginatively winsome and logically forceful ambassadors for Christianity that we've seen. For that very reason, it behooves us to cultivate a critically sound judgment about his influence. What is the theology that lies behind the popular apologetics, the Narnia books, and the Space Trilogy? How biblical is it? Some people think it's heretical. Other people think it's perfect. I doubt either of those conclusions is going to be justified. But how biblical is it? It's a question we need to ask. What are its strengths and weaknesses? Where does Lewis succeed in explaining and portraying the truth about Christ? And where in those presentations should be we wary, should we be wary or withhold judgment? These are all questions that need to be answered, and we'll try to explain why uh, in the next few minutes. So let's take a look at Lewis's life. Who was this man who became the most important amateur theologian in the history of the church? The uh, outlines of his life are well known. C.S. Lewis was born in 1898 in Northern Ireland. He lost his mother to cancer as a young lad and was sent to a series of horrible boarding schools where he lost the nominal faith of his childhood. He was tutored by William T. Kirkpatrick, uh, the model for Professor Kirk in the Narnia books, who taught him logic. Why don't they teach logic in those schools? Classical languages and an uncompromising love of debate and loyalty to truth. He served in the trenches of World War I and was wounded in action. He took a, a triple first-class degree in Oxford in classics, philosophy, and English. While there, his reading and his friends undermined his atheism, the story is told in full and surprised by joy, and he reluctantly became a theist and then a Christian. He became tutor in English at Modlin College, Oxford, where he became known as a Christian apologist, founded the J.R.R. Tolkien, the writer's group, The Inklings, and was the president of the Socratic Club, devoted to debates between Christians and atheists. He became professor of medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge. At both schools, he wrote literary scholarship that is still read today. Think about that for a moment and try to think of another major literary scholar of 60 to 80 years ago who can make the same claim. There isn't one. But Lewis's scholarship in literature is still read today by literature professors who don't care anything about his Christianity. I've met some who don't even know about it, but they think that stuff is still important, and they're right. Uh, he married Joy Davidman and lost her to cancer, inspiring a play and a movie very loosely based on that love story. He wrote the Narnia books, one of the most popular series of children's books of all time, and one of the most enjoyed by adults as well as children. He died on November the 22nd, 1963, the same day President Kennedy was shot. Now, the story is told in detail elsewhere, best by Green and Hooper, by George Sayer, and by Lewis himself in Surprised by Joy. What interests us here is the consistent manifestation in it of two traits which appear in such strength in the same, which rarely appear in such strength in the same person, and which in combination are what make Lewis a theologian still worthy of our attention 60 years after his death, despite his lack of formal training in that field. They were first a fertile imagination alive to beauty and the mystery of life, and second, a sharp logical mind capable of deep critical analysis. Now, we've got a few people who have the, the great imagination. We've got some people in the evangelical world, especially in the apologetics industrial complex, who have the sharp analytical mind to find anybody who has both bonded together, seamlessly working together the way Lewis did is extremely rare. That's a generational thing. And in fact, it's been a couple of generations since we've had anybody who was able to combine the two like Lewis does like Lewis did. It was precisely this combination that in his atheist phase would not let him rest content in his unbelief. 
He writes in his autobiography of the frustration of believing only in atoms in motion while caring only about gods and heroes in the great myths. A lesser man might have just given up on the gods and myths and become cynical. Lewis could not. He wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves on the 23rd of May, 1918, Fairies must be in the woods, or the satyrs merry broods, tritons in the summer sea, else how could the dead things be half so lovely as they are? I don't believe in anything but atoms in motion, and yet that makes no sense. Because if that were true, where would this beauty come from, and why would it dive so deeply into my soul and not leave me alone? Atoms dead could never thus move the human heart of us, unless the beauty that we see part of endless beauty be. Atoms dead could never thus move the human heart of us. Lewis, while he was still an atheist, saw a contradiction in the philosophy he had accepted. Not yet a contradiction in its logic, that would come later, but a contradiction between his reductionistic materialist philosophy and life itself. It would take some time to realize how to resolve this impasse with many false starts. He wrote to Greaves on the 29th of May, 1918. Uh, the conviction is gaining ground on me that after all, spirit does exist. I fancy there's something right outside time and place, which didn't create matter, as the Christians say, but is matter's great enemy, and that beauty is the call of that spirit to something in the spirit in us. The full Christian resolution would be some time in coming, but when it came, it would come in the form precisely of a healing of the troubling dichotomy. Adams thus, Adams dead could never thus move the human heart of us. So how is it getting moved? Not by Adams dead, certainly not. He, he would write to his brother, Warney, in 1931, that William Law's appeal to all that doubt or disbelieve is one of those rare works that make you say of Christianity, here's the very thing you like in poetry and romances, only this time it's true. Poetry? True. Yes. The thing to see here is that it was the dual impulse to both imagination and reason, plus the compulsion to find some kind of unity between them that would not be in conflict with life as we actually experience it. That's what drove Lewis long before he concluded that the answer to this problem is found in Christ. He found atheism made sense to his mind based on the premises it accepted, but it couldn't be lived. And Christianity eventually came to make sense to his mind on a new and deeper set of premises and was the thing that allowed life actually to be lived without contradiction. We can see it coming already. The rational apologetics that is full of apt analogy that could only come through imagination, and imaginary worlds of haunting beauty that contain as integral components set pieces of logical reason, like Puddleglum's refutation of the Green Witch, or Professor Kirk's use of the, of the, use of the trilemma, to uh, discover whether or not Lucy is telling the truth. There are only three possibilities. Either she's mad, or she's lying, or she's telling the truth. Now, it's obvious to everybody that she's not mad, and you tell me that she's not a liar. So until any further evidence turns up, we must conclude that she is telling the truth. Logic! Why don't they teach logic in those schools? Well, it's all in Plato. And it's all in Lewis. It's definitely all in Lewis. Rational apologetics that contains analogies that could only come from the imagination. The rooms in the hall of the house representing the denominations and Christendom in general. Uh, and then fantasy works that contain, that, that depend on logical analysis as well as fantasy for their plot to develop. We step from one to the other seamlessly. And that is why Lewis's theology matters. 
It is a theology for a Christian life that refuses to be reduced either to cold reason or passionate emotion and refuses to compromise either one to get the other. Whatever flaws we may discover it to have, it is a theology that flows from the drive to wholeness. Its ability to lead us in the direction of wholeness is a significant reason why we're still reading it. And it is the reason why we should also want to study it. Well, so let's study Lewis's theology. And as we begin to do that, we discover that there are certain difficulties in doing it. First, polarization. I already mentioned the fact that, that, that Lewis' fandom is divided between people who think he can do no wrong and people who think he's a heretic. They're not part of the fandom, but their voice is heard on the internet and shouldn't be read at all. Uh, it, people who think Lewis w was a, really a secret Roman Catholic, or at least he would have become one if he'd lived a little longer. People who uh, think he's a conservative evangelical who would fit right into an evangelical church in the United States. Lewis maintains this central focus on mere Christianity, but his readers are all over the map. And that polarization is a problem. Second, an awful lot of Lewis's theology and an awful lot of the most important uh, elements of it are communicated in fiction. And it obviously, uh, it's a little bit uh, complicated and a little bit difficult to try to derive theological doctrines from works of fiction. Uh, the third problem is that Lewis uh, this is not a problem with Lewis. It's a problem with us trying to study his theology, and that is his focus on mere Christianity, uh, his avoidance almost completely of issues that create distinctions and differences between different Christian denominations and traditions. Well, uh, obviously, you're not going to cover, cover every doctrine, and this uh, makes it hard to figure out what Lewis's theology was. Fortunately, he allowed himself in his letters sometimes to take positions that he would not have taken publicly. In private correspondence, when someone asked him a question, he might answer it and, and, and give them something that he wouldn't have put in one of his books. So we'll discover that there's a way around that problem. And finally, the sheer volume of Lewis's writing. Uh, 40 books plus innumerable essays, poems, it's fiction, uh, expository writing, etc. cetera. Uh, it's, it's, there's, it's, it's kind of like TIE fighters in Star Wars. There's too many of them. Well, that doesn't make sense. No, there's not enough of them, but there's too many of them if you're trying to get a handle on the whole thing and find out what Lewis's theology was out of it. So let's look at each one of these problems uh, in more detail. First, polarization. The first problem, ironically, given his commitment to mere Christianity, is that Lewis is a surprisingly polarizing force. It's hard to get an objective handle on him. He has attracted, on the one hand, an almost idolatrous kind of admiration from a certain kind of evangelical and been the subject of writings from that group that can only be called hagiography. In reaction to this, on the other hand, one finds a certain kind of scholar who thinks he'll get instant academic street cred if he can find fault with Lewis. He gets almost canonized by the one group and sometimes glibly patronized by the other. Meanwhile, people of almost every theological persuasion I only say almost to cover my posterior in case somebody finds one of which this is not true, but I can't actually think of any. People of just about every theological persuasion, fundamentalist, evangelical, neo-Orthodox, liberal, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, want to enlist Lewis in their, on their side. You can read tortured attempts by all these groups to claim that Lewis was really one of them or would have been if he'd lived just a little bit longer. Emotions get involved pretty quickly in some of these turf battles because there's genuinely a lot at stake. 
This situation alerts us to the danger that many people are more interested in using Lewis to support their own position than in truly understanding him. It's a real temptation because when Lewis is an ally, he's a formidable one. Now, I will try to resist the temptation to make Lewis more of a conservative evangelical Protestant, to give full disclosure about my own position, than he really was. He is often an ally of that camp, as it rightly perceives, but not always. To honor Lewis, in other words, we have first to honor truth. And the temptation not to do that is very strong. Second difficulty arises from the fact that Lewis's most popular books and among his most theologically influential are fiction. They're fiction, but they're not, except for the Pilgrim's Regress, allegory despite many careless statements by Lewis's readers to the contrary. An allegory is a work of symbolic fiction in which is a fairly simple correspondence between items or characters in the stories and what they represent in the real world. Now, I know there are more sophisticated allegories in which the relationships are not that simple, but I'm giving a rough definition here to make a point. For example, in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, you have characters with names like Mr. Worldly Wise Man and Faithful. wonder what they represent. Well, it's not hard to tell what they represent. And the words and actions that they give you are intended as direct illustrations of the concepts that they picture. So you're on pretty safe ground when talking about Bunyan's theology based on the Pilgrim's Progress. But Lewis's fictional writings are mostly not like that. Aslan is not simply Christ. He is Christ as he might have been if God created a world of talking animals and was incarnated there. Lewis referred to the things that happen in Narnia or the Space Trilogy as supposals, as distinguished from allegories. He explained to Edward T. Dale in a letter of uh, February 1949, you must not confuse my romances with my theses. In the latter theses, I state and argue a creed, miracles, mere Christianity. In the former, though, much is supposed for the sake of the story. So if, you, if you're trying to get some kind of theological meaning out of everything that happens in one of Lewis's fictional books, you're really barking up the wrong tree. Similarly, he wrote to a fifth grade class in Maryland in May of 1954. And here's the uh, quotation. Uh, on the screen. You are mistaken when you think that everything in the book, and he's talking about Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You're mistaken if you think that everything in the book represents something in this world. Things do that in Pilgrim's Progress, but I'm not writing in that way. I did not say to myself, let's represent Jesus as he really is in our world by a lion in Narnia. I said, let's suppose that there were a land like Narnia, and that the Son of God became a lion there, and then imagine what would happen. Well, that's a fun thing to do, and there's certainly some theology happening in it, but the relationship between the fiction and the theology is not as simple as it would be in an allegory. In the same vein, Ruiz wrote to Tony Pollock in May of 1954, behind my own stories there are no facts at all, though I hope there are truths, that is, they must be regarded as imaginative hypotheses illustrating what I believe to be theological truths. Imaginative hypotheses. Uh, and a, a hypothesis is a, on a little bit lower level than a doctrine. Okay? Not quite exactly the same thing. So you begin to see the problem in trying to figure out Lewis's theology based on the fiction. Most important passage for understanding the relation of the fiction to Lewis's theological beliefs may be this one. I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which had paralyzed much of my own religion in childhood. Why did I find it so hard to feel as one was told one ought to feel about God or about the sufferings of Christ? I thought that the chief reason that was one that was was that one was told one ought to. But supposing that by casting all these things into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glasses and Sunday school associations, 
One could make them for the first time appear in their real potency. Could not one steal past those watchful dragons? The fiction, then, is relevant to understanding Lewis's theology. There is theology there, stealing past watchful dragons to appear in potency. But one has to be careful about deriving theology from fiction. On the one hand, the children learn to know Aslan in Narnia so that they might learn his other name here. There, I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. That was the very reason you were brought into Narnia that by knowing me here, you might know me better there, says Aslan. And therefore, so we're intended to see parallels between Aslan or Maleldil and Christ, but we can't assume that any given detail in the story necessarily carries a doctrinal meaning. Rather, rather we should expect the parallels to be on the, le the level of major motifs, incarnation, sacrifice, substitution, etc., as Lewis reminds us, the only moral or doctrinal lesson that's of any value is that which arises inevitably from the whole cast of the author's mind. We want to know the theology that lies behind Narnia and the field of Arbol, but if Lewis gives us an accurate description of what he was doing, we should expect to find it first taught in expository works like Mere Christianity and Miracles, and then see it illustrated by Narnia and the Space Trilogy. So that's the methodology, the methodological approach I take is find the theology uh, in the uh, popular apologetics and the other expositions of, of Christian faith, and then see how it's illustrated in the fiction. And uh, when you put the two together, then it really, I think, comes into very uh, clear and powerful focus. Okay, so... Yeah, it, deriving theology from fiction is not a simple matter. Third complication arises from Lewis's strategy of focusing only on what he called mere Christianity. In the book of that name, he deliberately tries to avoid giving any advice to people who are hesitating between two rooms of the house of Christianity. He only wants to get them into the hall. He does tell them to look for truth rather than nice paneling or a charismatic doorkeeper, but he gives no guidance as to which room best fits that criteria. This is a strategy he tried to follow in all his writing and public speaking on behalf of the faith. As he wrote to Edward T. Dale in April of 1963, a great deal of my utility, my usefulness, has depended on my having kept out of all the dogfights between professing schools of Christian thought. Now, my point here is not to criticize Lewis for this strategy. It was what he took to be his calling, and he was certainly right that it contributed in significant ways to his usefulness. It has its advantages, and I follow it in some circumstances myself. But it does present some challenges for those who wish to study Lewis's theology. For, you see, Christian doctrine is not just a random set of unrelated propositions of which you might uh, you know, decide to discuss 40 out of 60. It's an integrated whole in which every part is related to every other part and all find their center in the very character of the God who revealed himself in Christ to the prophets and the apostles. To leave something out because it's controversial or thought by some not to be central is not necessarily just to leave something out. The omission might have an unintended effect on what is left in. And while many denominational differences are indeed over tragically peripheral matters, not all are. Some on both sides have thought that some of the questions at issue between Protestants and the Church of Rome, for example, go right to the heart of what the gospel is. Lewis's mere Christian stance then was both an asset and a liability to his ministry. It was both. It has advantages, it has its disadvantages. And both sides of the, that equation need to be taken into account. It's something we must remember as we evaluate his teaching. One of the problems it creates is that it opened up space for speculation by those who would like to enlist Lewis as allies for their own traditions. You know, if you're trying to make the case that, that Lewis uh, really was or should have been a Roman Catholic or 
anything else, and, and people from lots of different traditions have tried to do this, Lewis is not talking about the differences between denominations, leaves you lots of open space to speculate and, and say that, yeah, Lewis was really, really close to this. He was heading through this. He would have gotten there. Fortunately, Lewis sometimes allowed himself in private correspondence to take positions he would not have taken publicly. And we can use those moments to fill in gaps in the picture. They not only serve to eliminate certain unfruitful speculations, they can also provide context that illumines his public theology at certain points. So the new expanded three-volume edition of Lewis's letters is indispensable to anybody who wishes to get a complete view of Lewis's thinking. So, no, when you read the letters and Lewis allows himself to talk about why he's not a Roman Catholic, why he's a Protestant, you discover he's a principled Protestant and not just a default setting Protestant. And no, he wasn't on his way to becoming a Roman Catholic had he lived another five or ten years. Uh, it becomes very clear when you read the letters. Uh, he has great respect for that tradition. Uh, he counts it as a genuine room in the off the hall of the house. But uh, people, unfortunately, uh, can't resist speculation, especially if it supports their position. The fourth challenge is the sheer volume of Lewis's writing and the fact that you've got to go through that whole set of three thick volumes of fine print letters to, com to be complete is part of that picture. Popular apologetics, fiction, poetry, works of literary scholarship, letters, volumes of essays collected by Walter Hooper, well over 40 books all told, none of them irrelevant. For Lewis's mind, and consequently his work, was all of a piece. His friend and fellow inkling Owen Barfield said that the unity of Lewis's thought came from a quality Lewis, that Barfield called presence of mind. By this, he meant that somehow what Lewis thought about everything was secretly present in what he said about anything. Barfield, somehow what Lewis thought about everything was secretly present in what he said about anything. I've discovered that this is absolutely true. When we add to that the fact that he was often uh, commenting on Christian writers, so take, take his literary scholarship, for example. You wouldn't expect him to be talking about theology there. He did not expound Christian doctrine in his literary scholarship, obviously, but his views there were informed by the same Christian worldview that he expounded directly elsewhere. And when we add to that the fact that he was often commenting on Christian writers trying to win a sympathetic hearing for writers like Milton, for example, you realize that there's nothing in his body of writing so technical or obscure that it might not contain something relevant to this topic. One of the fringe benefits of uh, my study of Lewis's writings in uh, Deeper Magic then will be the way it illustrates the truth of Barfield's claim. Wow. So you've got the sheer volume, you've got the polarization, you've got dealing with the fiction, you've got uh, the limitations of trying to, uh, and almost consistently succeeding in limiting himself to mere Christianity, and you've got the fact that Lewis was not a professional theologian. So in conclusion, uh, why is it worth the effort to wade through all those difficulties? And of course, I did the heavy work in writing the book. If you get the book, you hopefully find that it, it helps you weave through them uh, much more easily and profitably. When he's only an amateur theologian in the first place, well, maybe the fact that he's an amateur theologian is actually a good thing. By calling Lewis an amateur theologian, I do not mean to imply that he was not a good one or in any way an unimportant one. The word should be taken in its etymological sense of one who does something not for a living, but for the love of it. All these quotations have been Lewis. This quotation right here is me. Uh, you know, if, if I get to say one thing about theology, as well as about Lewis's theology that I, I would like people to get, it's this. 
I would like theologians to get this, my fellow theologians. Love for God, amateur is from amo to love. An amateur is someone who does something for the love of it, not for a living. Love for God, love for God's truth, love for God's people. Apart from these loves, no one should presume to handle sacred things. In this sense, all the laity should be theologians and all the clergy amateurs. Uh, it's, it's simply a matter of, of practicality that some of us need to get paid for doing this. But doing theology, understanding the truth that God has revealed about himself and about his son for the love of it and of him and of his people, uh, that's what theology is all about. That Lewis had the right loves for this job is evident. His love of God helped him to keep himself out of the center and Christ in it. He wrote to Mary Margaret McCaslin in 1954. I'm shocked to hear that your friends think of following me. I wanted them to follow Christ. But they'll get over this confusion soon, I trust. His love of the truth made him uh, value faithfulness. If any parts of the book are original in the sense of being novel or unorthodox, they are so against my will and a result of my ignorance, he said in Problem of Pain. His love of God's people sent him to the BBC and to many R uh, RAF camps during the Second World War and made him work hard at the task of translation. His love of good English didn't hurt either. He wrote to Jocelyn Gibb in 1959, so many people when they begin research lose all desire and presently all power of writing clear, sharp, unambiguous English. Hold on to your finite transitive verb, your concrete nouns, and the muscles of the language. The more abstract the subject, the more our language should avoid all unnecessary abstraction. And he practiced that. He practiced what he preached as he wrote about theology. All these loves combined with the drive for the integration of reason and imagination, as we discussed earlier, contributed to Lewis's greatness as a writer and as a theologian. I think they also helped him see clearly what is at stake in our theology. Here is a door behind which, according to some people, the secret of the universe is waiting for you. Either that's true or it isn't. And if it isn't, then what the door really conceals is simply the greatest fraud, the most colossal sell on record. Isn't it obviously the job of every man that is a man and not a rabbit to try to find out which and then to devote his energies either to serving this great secret or expounding and destroying this gigantic humbug. Lewis so devoted his energies, and he can help us to do so too. I've been talking throughout this lecture about why we should care about Lewis as a theologian and care about his theology, in spite of all the difficulties involved. Perhaps I can best sum it up by applying to Lewis words that he wrote about John Milton. For in the final analysis, we only honor Lewis's memory to the extent that we do not really care that these ideas were Lewis's. We will only please his departed spirit if we care about them to the extent that they are true. And so I think he would be pleased if we see him as a guide who can point beyond himself as Beatrice did for Dante and as Milton did for Lewis himself. This is Lewis talking about Milton. I think it applies to Lewis. We are summoned not to hear what one particular man thought and felt about the fall, but to take part under his leadership in a great mimetic dance of all Christendom, ourselves soaring and reigning from heaven, ourselves entering hell and paradise, the fall and repentance. Yes, Lewis can help us do that. Well, I should say something about Lewis's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, as we conclude this lecture, um, he was not an exegetical theologian. His approach was not on any given doctrinal question to ask, what does scripture teach about this? And then inductively try to find out. Rather, what he did was to take the consensus 
that had been developed throughout the entire history of Christendom and uh, express that consensus in ways that brought out its, its truth and its beauty and its holiness and its power to change our lives. So where that consensus exists on the Trinity, on the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, et cetera, uh, Lewis uh, will take the theology that, that you've probably learned elsewhere and make it come to life. He's just wonderful. On, er, in areas where there isn't quite that kind of consensus, for example, uh, the atonement, uh, there are basically three areas in which uh, conservative evangelical Christians tend to disagree with Lewis. First, in the atonement, he does not, uh, he, he portrays the atonement better in the stone table in Narnia than he explains it in mere Christianity, where he does not deny, but kind of soft pedals uh, the Pauline notion of vicarious penal substitution. Uh, Lewis doesn't deny it, but neither does he make it essential, uh, as I think the Apostle Paul does to our understanding of the atonement. Uh, the second area uh, would be in uh, eschatology, Lewis uh, in The Last Battle, and also in The Great Divorce, leaves open the possibility of a second chance after death for conversion. Uh, a lot of evangelical Christians would have an issue with that. Um, but when you uh, stay away from that small group of issues on, on the major truths of Christianity, apart from those things, um, Lewis is a very, very sound and, and guide to the centrality of what Christian truth is. And uh, so... Uh, I encourage you to read Lewis. Uh, I encourage you uh, as you do. And uh, if you're looking for deeper insight into how he wrestles with things and exactly how he comes out in these different areas, uh, I encourage you to take a look at my book, uh, Deeper Magic, uh, Baltimore Square Hello Books 2016, in which I try to keep the promises that I've made in this lecture. So uh, check it out and see if I did. Thank you, Don. That was excellent. I really appreciate your comments and um, your humility in presenting Lewis, not as uh, not not making him the perfect saint that everybody has made him out to be. Neither being a cynic, uh, painting him with a, a you know a bad brush and just knocking everything down. So um, I'll take some questions, but I think one that I would like to explore, and this is a popular one, is that you mentioned in your book, uh, C.S. Lewis's inclusion of myth is a, a legitimate means of general res re revelation in what you call the constellation of sources. Could you say a bit more about this and its implications for his theology? Right. God has revealed himself. I mean, the only reason we can do theology is because God's revealed himself. Right. He revealed himself in nature because the heavens declare the glory of God. He revealed himself in history by calling Abraham and making out of him a nation from which would come the Messiah who died and rose again in history. He reveals himself supremely in Christ. And uh, scripture is the Rosetta Stone that gives us the ability to grasp and interpret the information that's coming to us from all those sources. Uh, just about all Christians, uh, although we might disagree on the niceties of how we define inspiration in Scripture, just about all faithful Christians would agree with that. Lewis adds one more element to it. Uh, so you've got that larger picture as the background. And then for Lewis, uh, he thinks that mythology, that the mythology of um, different human traditions is also uh, a way in which God has revealed himself. Uh, in order to understand this, you have to understand how Lewis's conversion came about. Okay. Um, you know, he, he was uh, 
wrestling with these things, he had already concluded that God must exist because Adam's dead can never thus move the human heart of us, had not yet accepted Christ as the Son of God. Uh, and he has this conversation with Tolkien on Addison's Walk, uh, where Tolkien points out, look, when you find things like a dying God who gives life to his people in pagan mythology, you're deeply moved by it. And then when you encounter it in the New Testament, you reject it. But look, it's, it's the myth that actually happened. This is myth become fact. That's Lewis's phrase that he used in a later essay explaining Tolkien's point. Yeah. And so uh, in myth, you have man trying to stumble toward the truth. So the myths don't reveal God in the sense that you can, that, that pagans were right about <clears throat> Zeus or Apollo or anybody else. But in those myths, people are, are expressing their hunger for the kind of answers that they they put together in in fragmented and corrupted ways, but which find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ, uh, who is, as Lewis would put it in the essay, myth become fact. So uh, if you, I mean, it, it's easy to misunderstand Lewis there because people look at the word myth and they think a myth is a false story, a story yeah. that didn't happen. Uh, and you have to understand Lewis's use of the word myth. Myth is a gleam of truth falling into the dirt of a corrupted human mind. And so it doesn't have the inspiration that the Holy Spirit used to prevent the apostles and prophets from uh, misrepresenting God, but the, the fact that it's there tells us something. It tells yeah. it that there is something beyond uh, dead atoms. And uh, I think when you take that witness in the context of the other sources of revelation, especially with scripture in the, uh, the controlling point of, of being the plumb line that brings everything into focus. Uh, I think it's a, a, an interesting and useful way of looking at things. Yeah. And I think you, 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 you balance it out nicely in the book when you give the, the caution uh, with the rise of neo-paganism and things like that, that mm -hmm. we do have to use this concept carefully, but that the apostle Paul does validate this with his experience on Mars Hill. So I think yeah, that was very, right. very useful. If if it helps anybody read the book, let that let that be another tease. I think you you treated it, that with great care. Really interesting to to think to to speculate about whether Lewis might have written some things a little differently had he been alive today, because hmm. he could assume that uh, that show enough paganism was not really a live option for most people. Yeah, and uh, we can't uh, I mean, he we we can't make that assumption anymore. Okay, well, we have a question from, oh, there was one with Tolkien here. Uh, yes, better question. Uh, our kids ask, if Tolkien wrote that he did not intend The Lord of the Rings to be an allegory, but admitted that it was in the revision, do you feel that Tolkien is a better writer than C.S. Lewis to his use of books to share his faith? He did not intend The Lord of the Rings to be an allegory, and it was not an allegory even in the revision. What he said was that, the Lord of the Rings was a profoundly religious and Christian work, unintentionally in the beginning, but intentionally in the revision, meaning that as he wrote it, he became aware of how profoundly his own deepest beliefs had affected the story and were coming uh, to life in it, and took deliberate steps to strengthen them as, as the book proceeded to its conclusion. Uh, so Tolkien, Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. Narnia is not an allegory. Uh, I think that Lewis and Tolkien are both 
extremely good at using their books to share their faith. Lewis is more explicit than Tolkien. Lewis comes closer to allegory than Tolkien does. In a, in a, a, a scene like the stone table is almost allegorical, actually. Uh, but that happens only in isolated scenes. Uh, usually it's the more general type of symbolism that I was talking about earlier. Um, they're different. Uh, Tolkien's Christianity is, is very deeper beneath the surface than Lewis's is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I think wh which of them is more effective might depend on the reader. Uh, sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to try to, uh, wouldn't want to try to put them in competition with each other, other than to say they both belong in the top two. <laughs> That's a good answer. Good answer. Um, Adam asks, if Lewis is not an exegetical theologian, is he a consensus theologian? Yes, I think that's what he tried to be. He tried to express the consensus that had uh, stayed consistent for 2,000 years in the history of the church. So uh, the, the apostles, the apostolic fathers, the Nicene fathers, uh, you know, if, if if Augustine and Aquinas and Luther and Calvin and Wesley all agree on something, that's probably true. Uh, and and Lewis uh, wanted to focus on the stuff that they would have all agreed on. Um, so uh, it's important that he did that. You know, there are limitations to doing that. There are certain questions that I don't think can adequately be answered that way. Yeah. But we have so many denominations and so many divisions in Christianity, and it's a scandalous thing. And most people don't realize that um, there is this solid and tremendous consensus that really does exist and has been very persistent for 2,000 years. Uh, believing Christians, now, I mean, there are a lot of people who self-identify as Christians who aren't. Uh, you know, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you don't believe the Bible is inspired, just be honest and say you're not a Christian. But amongst faithful believing Christians, the three major divisions of Christianism, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy, agree on all but one word of the Nicene Creed. Protestants and Catholics agree on the whole Nicene Creed. That's a lot of very important, substantial foundational material. Not saying some of the other things aren't important. Right. Uh, but one of the great benefits of, of, of absorbing Lewis's approach to theology is he really shows you the, the, the size and the strength and the deeply founded rootedness of that consensus, uh, which people looking at it superficially completely miss. All the, the problem is we, we only tend to talk about our disagreements. And yeah. we stupidly have uh, family uh, discussions in front of outsiders. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are certain certain things we have to discuss between our, each other, but we do this in front of the world, and yeah, and uh, we take the disunity that history has created, and we actually make it look worse than it actually is. It's bad yeah. enough. Uh, okay. And and well, there's... we're not going to unwrite two thousand years of history and make it go away by snapping our fingers. But this, the, this, what we need to do is start by loving each other and, um, and by reaffirming the things we have in common and then move on to discuss the other things. But, but as a family discussion and not as a public one, if we can possibly avoid it. Loving one another. That's a novel concept, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, who was it? Seemed like somebody else said that before I did. Uh, 
Somebody did. I've heard it somewhere. Um, we have two questions that are related, and I'll, I'll start with the more specific one. Um, our kids asks if C.S. Lewis said George McDonald was his master, and he refutes penal substitution, substitutionary atonement. How do you reconcile that? And then Cindy follows up with asking you to elaborate a little bit, a little bit more on Lewis's view on the role and meaning of the atonement. So, okay, address that. Yeah. Uh, master is in the context of a schoolmaster. Often in British uh, schools, the uh, teacher is called the master. Uh, not master in the sense of master-slave, but master in the sense of master-student. And so uh, Lewis gave MacDonald credit for uh, being a tremendous influence in his life and a uh, and a huge mover of him toward his conversion. But uh, he didn't treat MacDonald as infallible, uh, and he didn't agree with him on everything. MacDonald was a universalist. Lewis was not. Uh, MacDonald uh, had a stronger rejection of uh, vicarious substitution. I, I mean, MacDonald... I, I, to understand McDonald, I think you have to see him in the context of Scottish hyper-Calvinism, uh, which he was reacting and I think overreacting against, and Lewis wasn't. So Lewis, uh, I think Lewis took all the good stuff in McDonald and filtered out the stuff that, that wasn't uh, so good. And, and uh, the McDonald that comes to us through Lewis uh, the McDonald that you see as a character, for example, in The Great Divorce, uh, wonderful and, and actually better than I, I think than the uh, historical McDonald. Now, Lewis, in his discussion of the atonement, lists a number of different theories about how it works. First, he makes an important point that what matters most is that the atonement happened. And that it works is more important than how it works. Uh, and so how does it work? Well, here are some of the different ways of understanding that. Um, and he talks about uh, penal substitution. He talks about um, uh, the, the moral example theory, etc. cetera. And um, Lewis doesn't reject vicarious penal substitution. In fact, he says that um, that it's kind of growing on him. Uh, it doesn't seem as silly to him as it used to. Uh, but what he does say is, uh, here's the different ways of understanding it. You can kind of take them or leave them. And uh, I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul says. I, I think that... Uh, penal substitution is essential and necessary. Um, so uh, Lewis doesn't reject it, but he doesn't give it the same stress or place that I think the New Testament does. And, yeah. and th that's a weakness. Okay. Where do you stand? A related question, because you brought up that McDonald was a universalist. Where do you stand on Lewis as sort of an inclusivist, given examples in the last battle and people bringing up the great divorce and, and those sorts right. of challenges yeah. to his view. I hear a lot of people say Lewis was a universalist, but he wasn't. No, he not, not a universalist. Right. Hell, and he believed that there would be people in it for eternity. Um, he was, however, uh, might have been an inclusivist. You got to remember, he says, these are supposals about what might be. They're hypotheses. Um, and so you don't want to der der derive a kind of a dogmatic position from them, but clearly, uh, I'll take the last battle because that's the more familiar passage to more people. Uh, clearly emeth, which is the Hebrew word for truth, by the way, emeth, who's not an asinine worshiper, he's a Tash worshiper. He's experienced. Expecting when it turns out that Aslan's the true God, he's expecting to be in a heap of trouble. And Aslan says, No, you were serving me all along without realizing it. Um, and uh, so 
the idea is that uh, you can only be saved by the sacrifice of Christ. Everybody who's saved is saved by that. But the inclusivist thinks that there that some people can be saved without knowing about it until after death. Perhaps they meet uh, Aslan or they meet Jesus after death and and realize that uh, that they were believing in him all along without knowing his name. Um, man, I think any of us ought to wish that that would be true, to hope that that might be true. Uh, and I'm not prepared to dogmatically say God can't find an extraordinary way to save people who've never heard the gospel. But um, here's my personal take on it is that as a Christian theologian, I have been given the responsibility to proclaim the gospel, and I've been given a very specific message. And that message is, if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth God, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you should be saved. That is a promise I am authorized to make to anybody on this planet as an ambassador of Christ, I have been given the authority to offer this to everybody and promise them that on this basis, they will be saved. And uh, there is no other way that's given, okay? And so if you ask me, well, what does the person who hasn't heard the gospel need to do to be saved? Well, he needs to confess with his mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead. And uh, I can't promise him salvation on any other basis. Now, God is a God of infinite mercy and justice, and he will do what's right with the people who hadn't heard. And uh, if it turns out that there are emoths in heaven, I'm not going to be shocked and I'm definitely not going to be disappointed, but I can't promise you that you can get to heaven that way. There is no such promise mm -hmm. in Scripture. So when Paul, in, in developing the train of thought in Romans, you know, he, he, he talks about justification in chapters 3, 4, 5, develops the Christian life in 8, etc. And... Uh, you know, it, it's when he gets to a certain point, he's like, "Well, uh, how can they he, how can they have faith unless they hear, and how can they hear without a preacher?" And so, the closest scripture comes to dealing explicitly with those who have not heard the gospel is there. And what Paul tell, says is, "You better go tell them." Okay. Yeah. So I think that uh, we should be slow to talk about ultimate salvation, which is in the hands of God. But we can talk about the assurance of salvation. I cannot give you an assurance of salvation on any other basis than confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Uh there is no other promise on any other basis that's made. And there is no assurance of salvation offered to us on any other basis. So uh, personally, I would not have written the, uh, the Emmeth and Aslan passage uh, for two reasons. First, I'm not good enough to, I'm not a good enough writer to have written it. And second, I, I think it's kind of stepping outside my commission as an ambassador of Christ. Yeah. I've been, I've been given the authority to offer very specific terms to the world. And uh, I don't need to be indulging in speculation about the hard cases. Uh, can you be saved? Without doing that, without doing Romans 10, 9, and 10, uh, I can't promise you that. 
I can promise you that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him to the dead, that you will be saved. And so I, I think we need to stick to that promise. Um, Lewis uh, felt uh, free to go beyond what scripture, uh, I think, explicitly allows in that passage. And uh, it, uh, it gives a lot of people some serious second thoughts. Um, yeah, that's one reason think, people write them off, probably. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it should stop us from benefiting from Lewis or even from that passage. I mean, uh, God, I mean, it's a difficult problem because... Yeah. You know, you, 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 you read these stories about a missionary who goes, you know, first missionary in the tribe, and uh, and he tells them the gospel, and they say, we've known this had to be true. Thank you for telling us his name. All right, well, what about the people who died the day before the missionary showed up? Yeah. Who didn't know the name of Jesus, but somehow had had developed a faith that made it easy for them to accept the gospel when it was when yeah. it was proclaimed to the people who were left you know i'm not going to make any dogmatic statements about who's in heaven and who's in hell except to say what scripture lets me say and that is yeah i think it, you're right it's best not to speculate and you're right if there are emmons in yeah. heaven we, we know god is perfectly just and we we won't have a problem with that one bit if there are emmons in heaven I'll be happy. I won't even be shocked, but I can't promise you that there will be. Yeah. 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 Well, I've got a question for you on faith. And I love that your, your discussion in the book where you juxtapose Lewis's understanding of faith and knowledge. Could you say a little bit more specifically? I like your example uh, of Aslan's table in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, where the following lines were uttered. You can't know, you can only believe or not. Could you say a little bit about Lewis's understanding of uh, faith and knowledge? Yeah, faith and knowledge, faith and reason are, are two uh, pairs that pair themselves up as a double pair in, insistently. And I think a lot of people uh, assume that faith and knowledge are just two completely different things. Um, and that faith and reason are two different things. Like faith and reason are a zero-sum game. The more you have of the one, the less you have of the other. Right, right. Uh, but the the demons know that God is real and that Christ is his son. And they believe in the sense that they... Uh, acknowledge that it's so, but they don't have faith because they don't trust. So faith is personal trust in God. Faith is personal trust in God, specifically in terms of his offered Savior, Jesus. Uh, you can have that trust for good reasons, bad reasons, or no reasons. I've met people who've done all three. It's better to have good reasons and Lewis can give them to you. Um, so uh, faith is that personal trust in God, specifically in his offer of the gospel through his son, Jesus. Um, when we have knowledge, when we see Christ face to face, we will still trust him. We'll trust him even more. Uh, you can't know, you can only believe or not. Uh, what's being said there is that uh, you can't have in this life 100% slam dunk, absolute proof with no uh, loopholes. Uh, you can't know 
if the food is going to feed you until you eat it. Hmm. So, okay, so they're, they're sitting there, and uh, is it going to be okay? You, you, they, they eventually know, <laughs> right? Right, right. But they can't know before they put it in their mouth. Uh, you can only believe or not. And so uh, faith and knowledge aren't enemies. Faith and reason aren't enemies. Uh, faith isn't a different way of knowing from regular knowing. Faith is trusting. And we trust God's promises based on his character as it's been demonstrated in history and in, and in Christ. And, uh, you know, is this word, related no, to word no is, is an interesting word. You know, do I know that God exists? I'm tempted to say yes. Uh, insofar as I know anything. Uh, but it's not the way most people use the word no. And the important thing is uh, whatever you know or don't know about him, based on what you're able to know about him, do you trust him? You know, Satan knows, but he doesn't trust because uh, he'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me, I think it was Augustine who said, uh, I believe that I may know. It seems very Augustinian if I'm remembering that correctly. Mm -hmm. So. Credo ut intelligam. I believe so that I may understand. Okay. Um, which is unavoidable, you know, because, um, you know, I uh, I look and see that uh, your uh, face is on the screen and uh, we're talking to each other. But, uh, you know, how do I know that uh, I'm not part of the matrix and somebody's manipulating this stuff? You know, right. how do I know that you're really there and you're not a, uh, a, a hologram yeah. uh, being manipulated by Ashley or somebody, you know, to make uh, me my think. My name is Bill Smith. Conversation. Is a, a deep uh, fake. <laughs> you know, I... I I, I have to trust. How do I know that my senses are giving me real information about the world? Yeah. How do I know that my mental processes uh, are capable of dealing with that information? You know, you can't prove any of those things because unless you assume them, you can't build a proof. Yeah. So uh, Augustine was right. Everything starts with faith. That's unavoidable. You might as well put your faith in the one being that can actually serve as the foundation for knowledge. Uh, it's not me. It's not my mind. It's not uh, my senses. What am I going to put my faith in? Humanism? No. Uh, if God made the world, and if God made me in his image so that my mind is in the image of the same God who designed the world, then real knowledge about the world becomes theoretically possible. Yeah. So you got to trust something. It might as well be God because he's the only thing big enough to actually pull off the, uh, the feet of providing a sufficient ground for our knowledge of anything. Yeah. Well, here's a more practical question for you. Uh, do you have any advice for uh, ARC kids on how to teach the Narnia books to kids in church? Uh, do we know how old these kids are? It's a good question. Um, um, I have to just assume in general, by the time we get a response, we'll probably be out of time. Yeah. Um, Just do it. The Narnia books will teach themselves. Um, and uh, let the kids enjoy them and then be there to answer any questions they have. Uh, maybe ask some leading questions uh, if you need to to get it started. But um, 
Yeah, I, I think the great thing about the Narnia books is that they'll teach themselves if you just just let the kids at them. Yeah. Well, and and here's a a, a a plug for the institute. We have a program called Keeping the Faith, where we do have some resources that are designed to help parents and grandparents mm. disciple their children using Chronicles of Narnia. So you could you can tap into that as well. So if you visit our website, yeah. um, but you're right. I mean. Those books have been reaching children and adults alike for decades. So just just teach them. Uh, I think we got two more. This one's a quick one, though. Uh, Mary Ellen was asking for some clarification. If you could uh, highlight which word uh, is in, in disagreement about on the Nicene Creed. The Latin word filioqua, which uh, means and the son. It's in the section dealing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in uh, the version of the creed that is believed by both Protestants and Roman Catholics. So Western Christianity uh, affirms that word. Eastern Orthodoxy leaves that one word out. The Spirit proceeds only from the Father. Okay. Now, what is the significance of that and what difference does it make? We could spend a whole other evening on that but that's the uh, basic answer to the question okay well then our, our last one will be one that i've got and i'd like to maybe tie it into our mission of the institute here but here at the institute we like to engage and promote in discipleship of the heart and mind and i would like to think lewis himself would approve because of his integration of reason and imagination would you agree and is there anything uh, to that integration uh that that we can all draw from in our own personal discipleship mm. Yes, I do agree. Uh, I think Lewis would have some uh, rather complicated relationships to some of his disciples today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, he's all about uh, transcending. I don't know if he was even conscious of it or not, but this, I mean, to me, one of the major impacts of his life on me is just he shows me what it is to transcend the dichotomies that we create uh, between heart and mind, reason and imagination, etc. cetera. Uh, Lewis just shatters that simply by standing there and being himself and uh, writing, you know, uh, writing that uh, expository apologetic work that's Lewis is the greatest master of the analogy in the history of the English language. He comes up with these analogies that that's the major way he takes difficult theological ideas and makes them conceivable and makes them meaningful to people. It's the, that's the imagination. And then You've got uh, Professor Kirk doing the trilemma as an integral part of the plot of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, you know, Puddle Glum's wonderful refutation of the Green Witch when he stomps on the fire. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, as Lewis said to Warney, a version of the ontological argument for children. Hmm. Uh, I've got an article on that in Touchstone uh, a couple years ago. Uh, somebody might want to look up, but it's just you know. We'll look it up and we'll post it in the notes to the uh, to the to this page. Yeah. So it's it's uh, yeah. I think I think Lewis would be very happy uh, about that goal, and I think you guys are doing a great job. Yeah, and I, I like the fact that you use the word integration. It, it does seem that when we have these juxtapositions or paradoxes that many times we are uh, complacent enough to rest in one or the other, but he really does integrate and synthesize these things so well um, and, and, and doesn't, yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with you on that one. I love how he yeah. just continues to just Another seems word like zero, so not erring one way or the other. Another word I would throw in is incarnate. He incarnates yeah. that integration. He does. Uh, Absolutely. He did it in his own life. His characters do it in his books. Um, 
got another book called uh, Mere Humanity. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis on the human condition. Um, and uh, I've now forgotten why I brought that up. But uh, We were talking about the, the incarnation. incarnation. Yes. Uh, one of the one of the things I I deal with in that book is that Lewis and Tolkien and Chesterton expound a a robust Christian doctrine of man in their expository writings, and then they incarnate it in the fiction. That's one of the major uh, major things I talk about there is is how that happens with uh, in in. Uh, the Narnia books, you've got Talking Beasts. In the Space Trilogy, you've got Serenity and Fifthal Triggy and, and Trasa. They're, uh, they're rational, physical creatures, spiritual creatures who aren't human. And um, so they are foils to bring out the essence of what it is to be human as we see them interacting with the human characters in those books. Then Tolkien does the same thing with elves and dwarves. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Lewis uh, did it so well that he, he went beyond talking about it and actually incarnated it. Well, I think we all echo Mary Ellen's comments when we say thank you for tonight. Uh, we appreciate these uh, last two sessions you've done with us on Tolkien and, and Lewis helped us just explore them a little more deeply. Um, it's a little too simplistic simply to uh, enjoy them as yeah. fiction writers or, you know, uh, literary giants. They're, they're so much more. And uh, you've helped us just plumb the depths even just a little bit more. Like you said, we're, we weren't going to get to the bottom of Lewis tonight, but uh, it's, a, it's a good start. So we really appreciate um what you shared with us. Do you have any parting comments for us or any tips for us as we want to explore uh, either Lewis or Tolkien a little bit deeper, uh, tying in the, our previous session on Tolkien? Yeah. Read, uh, just, just read Lewis and read Tolkien and uh, then you'll be able to come up with your own parting comments. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. Well, Farewell, wherever you fare to your iries receive you at your journey's end. Fantastic. Well, Which thank you. Have a good night. Among eagles. And that's a parting comment from yeah. The Hobbit. Yes, a, a classic, one of my favorites. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, visit our website, www.cslewisinstitute.org, if you're interested in learning more about the C.S. Lewis Institute, if you want to become a C.S. Lewis Fellow. Uh, we'll be taking applications for that tuition-free program again in early 2023. If you want to tap into um, all of the resources that we have, um, we've got 40 years of resources, both video and audio and written content there to help you in your own discipleship of heart and mind. And again, uh, please consider uh, donating to help us continue providing these sorts of resources. We have Lewis studies. We've got um, video and study guides on anything you'd like on Lewis just about. So uh, with that, I'll sign off for tonight, and thanks for joining us. Have a great night.